I'm Carl Dannenberger, and in this presentation we will be discussing Goff's arrival in the United States. Three reported events document early Goff in the United States. It has been reported that golf clubs were imported into South Carolina and Georgia after the American Revolutionary War, but there was no evidence golf was played. The first clubs where golf was played in North America appeared in Canada, at what is known as Royal Montreal in 1873 and Royal Quebec in 1874. In 1988, John Reed, a Scotsman, staked out a three-hole golf course near his home in Yonkers, New York, with some friends, and then later in the year staked out a six-hole golf course in a pasture, and with his friends named the club St. Andrews, which is believed to be the first golf course in the United States. I guess John Reed was not shy or a low-key guy to give the club that name. Interestingly, in China and Asia, a number of the courses have names that have been copied from famous courses in the United States. For example, this golf course in China is named Pine Valley. Although St. Andrews holds firm to the idea that they are the oldest club in America, there are others listed here who have staked a claim to be the oldest. Once golf was introduced, it spread quickly. In 1896, there were over 80 golf courses in the United States, but by 1900, that total had grown to 982. This might be the time to ask why it took a relatively long time for golf to be introduced into the United States, and other sports like cricket never really caught on here. A partial explanation might be that we had fought for our independence against the English, and also had battled the English in the War of 1812. That was basically a draw. I think at the time, Americans were probably angry and did not want to adopt activities associated with the English. This is a small cemetery outside of Columbus, Ohio, that is located along Darby Creek Golf Course. Many of the tombstones speak to the people who fought or died during the War of 1812. The first imported golf course architect was Willie Dunn, Jr., from the famous Dunn family of Scotland. His dad, Willie Dunn, Sr., and his dad's twin brother, Jamie, played in numerous challenge matches from 1840 through 1860. Willie Dunn, Jr. was an accomplished golfer and ahead of his time in many ways. He was experimenting with steel-shafted clubs at the turn of the century and using a wooden peg or tee instead of a pinch of sand taken from a hole that was a standard practice for teeing your ball up. This is a photograph of a Willie Dunn ad for his golfing business. As mentioned, Willie Dunn was playing around with developing wooden tees. Prior to a wooden tee, you would fill this small cup with sand, then invert it on the tee and place your ball. But back to Willie Dunn Jr., the golf architect. He was helping his brother Tom, who was a famous in his own right, lay out a course in Baritz, France, when he left for the United States to lay out a course for the newly formed Shinnecock Hills Golf Club. Using an inexperienced workforce and inadequate equipment, Dunn laid out the 12-hole golf course and stayed on as the pro greenskeeper. Unfortunately, from a golf course design perspective, Shinnecock was way out on Long Island and generally inaccessible. It would have been a good idea for developers and others who were building golf courses at the time to visit the golf course and see what a golf course should look like because most of the courses built at this time were atrocious. People who knew nothing of designing or building a golf course, let alone know how to play it, were laying out golf courses. A few of the more interesting people involved in golf course architecture are listed here. I'll mention George Wright and Lemuel Altimus. George Wright laid out a simplistic course in Boston known as Franklin Park. 
so he, the owner of Wright and Ditz and Sporting Goods, could sell golf clubs. Here is a picture of an old putter with the Wright, Ditz and stamp. The company now is mainly into apparel, focusing on jerseys from the past eras. A colorful architect of the day was Lemuel Ultimus, who laid out Devon Golf Club in Philadelphia, who fancied himself as a polo player and rode around the construction site on a horse under the guise that he was determining the proper driving distances. According to this press report on a polo match, the mill may not have been very good at that either. Willie Dunn Jr., who among all these amateur architects, summoned his friends and family to come to the United States because he thought the future of golf was here. His friends and family members became involved in all aspects of golf. I think sometimes the Scottish accent probably helped considerably, given that many Americans thought if you were Scottish, you knew everything about golf which was not always true. During the late 1890s and early 1900s, the method of laying out a golf course was short and sweet. Tom Bendelow, who immigrated from Scotland and worked for the New York Herald, quit his job in 1895 and went to work for A.G. Spalding and Brothers as a golf course design consultant. He did over 400 golf courses, probably the most prolific of his time. He was dubbed 18 stakes on a Sunday afternoon. In fact, he did lay out a number of golf courses in this fashion, but it could be more than 18 stakes. He would normally stake out the first tee, pace off 100 yards, stake out where the cross bunker would be, pace on further, stake out another bunker or some mounds, walk a little further, and stake out the green site. After completing his golf course, he would leave instructions with the club on how to properly build and maintain the course and he would be on his way. Some of you might think this is terrible. What do you expect for $25? Clubs at the time were unwilling to pay more than $25 no matter how long you took to lay out the course. And in all fairness, this was pretty common practice for most golf course designers, including Donald Ross, who on occasion would lay out a $25 golf course. This is not to say that Tom Bendelow did not design some outstanding golf courses. Some of those include Medina Country Club in Chicago, which is shown here, along with Olympic Fields. East Lake in Atlanta, which is shown here, was another club that he did. Tom Bendelow later in his career lectured at the University of Illinois on golf course architecture. As a personal note, he never swore, drank, or told off-color jokes. His only vice was smoking large cigars. For the most part, golf courses of this time were really primitive and in not very good shape. Construction normally consisted of removing fences, collecting surface stones, and piling them up into what is known as chocolate drops, shown here, and mowing the grass. That was about the extent of construction. Oftentimes, the grass in bunkers was left to grow long, thus the term dragon teeth. Some courses had cross-routing, natural obstructions, including stone walls, trees, plowed fields, and fences. It is amazing that people still play these courses and actually help grow the game. Given the conditions of these crude golf courses, even dating back to the 1850s and before then in Scotland, when golf moved inland, you had to wonder how golf clubs stood up. The early irons were used somewhat sparingly back in the 1830s and 40s, but they could easily destroy the feathery golf balls of the day. Most shots were accomplished by a range of wooden clubs. Wooden clubs in a variety of shaft lengths and face lofts as shown here were used for most shots. Obviously these kind of clubs would probably not hold up in these crude inland type of American golf courses. Iron clubs were made by blacksmiths until perhaps the 1870s. As a result they were rather crude 
heavy implements with massive hosels that were hard to use. Fortunately, when drop forging became widely available, the mass of clubs decreased considerably. The words hand forged on the back of hickory shaft clubs in the 1900s was in fact a misnomer, as the only thing done by hand by that time was the impressing of the maker's name in cleek mark. The advent of drop forging in the late 1800s meant better iron clubs could be mass produced in factories. Wooden headed clubs were usually handmade by local golf professionals until perhaps 1910, when factories started to make them due to the huge demand for golf equipment, and this contributed greatly to the growth of golf in popularity. Specialty irons were developed. One of the most popular, which is partially out of this picture on the right, is the rutting iron. The rutting iron was used to extract balls that had landed in cartwheel ruts. As you can see, there were such clubs as the water iron and the iron rake. All of these clubs were made specifically for obstacles or shots that were faced on many of these crude golf courses. Not all the golf courses were uneventful. One we've mentioned so far was Shinnecock. Another one is Newport Country Club in Rhode Island. William Davis was pro greenskeeper at Royal Montreal, who then moved to the U.S. where he designed Newport Country Club, at the time a nine-hole golf course. It was expanded to 18 holes in 1915 by Donald Ross and then remodeled by A.W. Tillinghast. Newport hosted the first U.S. Amateur Championship and the first U.S. Open in 1895. As some background, the United States Golf Association was formed in 1894 to resolve a dispute between Newport Country Club and St. Andrews Golf Club in New York, who earlier in the year had each crowned winners of their tournament's national amateur champion. In the fall of that year, Delegates from clubs including Newport, St. Andrews, the Country Club in Brookline, Chicago Golf Club, and Shinnecock Hills met in New York and formed the United States Golf Association. The first U.S. Amateur Championship was played in 1895 at Newport and was won by Charles B. McDonald. The following day, the U.S. Open was held almost like an afterthought at Newport. At the time of the U.S. Open, the nine-hole golf course was played in one day four times for a total of 36 holes. The winner got $125 out of a purse of $325. The winner was Horace Rollins, shown here, an English professional golfer. In the following presentations, we will look at the dominant players in some of the classic golf courses that were originally built during the late 1800s and early 1900s.